I wrote the book partly as a, a history of my own journey coming here to the South, but also for others who are making that same journey, whether they're internationals or they're transplants from elsewhere in the United States. The South has a very particular culture, uh, and it's not always easy to navigate. In the first chapter, Why Take This Journey, Going Southern, um, I talk about why I've made the journey. I felt that it would be uh, very um, comfortable for me to come to the South after having lived in Bermuda, which is a combination of British colonial island and, and the South. Uh, and also, I felt that the South was coming into its own. There are lots of international companies here. There are lots of opportunities, vendors, new businesses being started up in the South uh, at, at a rather rapid pace, and I wanted to be part of that. So uh, I tell people that this is a good reason for them also to come to the South uh, the, and experience a rather unique piece of, of American culture in the making. One of the things that, that we see sometimes of the internationals who come in who are used to traveling, used to different cultures, and they end up perhaps here for a few years, they'll say to me, um, could you please also train the Americans coming into the South? Because I think they have expectations that, that um, of what they're going to see and experience that are unrealistic. Some of them are, are, are based on um, the fact that everybody is very friendly and will smile and greet you, um, be very uh, happy to see you, and will say to you, oh, we must get together, you must come over to the house someday. Um, people don't understand that in the South that is part of the etiquette, part of saying hello. Um, that doesn't mean that they actually want you to come to their house or that that's actually extending an invitation. Uh, that takes a little more doing. So it's a little confusing for people who first arrive. Who are the real Southerners? When I ask this question, when I give presentations, I said, how many generations do you have to be here to be considered a, a, a real Southerner, a true Southerner? Um, the minimum is three. It's more likely it's four and occasionally five, and I have had a few people claim that it needs to be ten. Um, but you can see that in the South, we've had a situation where um, our, our younger generations have not chosen to move away, have stayed and um, have been part of the culture for a very long time. A and that means that um, there is a sense of, of, of real Southerners uh, that's unlike anything I've seen in the rest of the country. This list uh, is uh, are strategies for um, following some of our uh, well-known Southern talent. Uh, and I put this in the book because in many ways these people, particularly our musicians, are some of the best well-known Southerners worldwide. So, for example, I asked people to pick a Southern musician or two to follow. Personalities are key conversation pieces in the South and a good tool for making friends. So if you find that you really, really uh, love the music of the band Leonard Skinner, um, listen to it, go for it. You will find company uh, in that um, fan base, for sure. So then we come choose a southern music genre to follow and get familiar with the musicians in that genre. So there's so many. There's gospel, there's uh, rockabilly, there's rhythm and blues, country. There's something for everybody, and there's plenty of performances and festivals, and I suggest here. Attend a festival where the genre is featured, Festivals and concerts can be found in most locations in the South, particularly in the warm weather months. Um, any day of the week. <laughs> ah, this one. If you sing or play an instrument, learn some Southern songs. The experience will give you a feel for Southern culture and give you something to share with others. So can I tell you a story about this? Um, a few weeks ago, I was in Huntsville, Alabama, at the university there, uh, asked to do a workshop for a group of Fulbright scholars. Um, 
because I have such uh, an investment in the arts as a way to get used to uh, culture, I brought along with me some videos to show. So I showed a video of Leonard Skinner, the band Leonard Skinner, performing Sweet Home Alabama. Now in the, in the, in the room, there were both the Al uh, Fulbright scholars and the professors and uh, local leaders working with them. And you could tell who was whom. The scholars thought, wow, that's interesting. And the locals were just mm, da, 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 home out, singing along. Then to show the, sl the flip side of that, I showed a video of Sweet Home Alabama being sung by the Leningrad Cowboys with the Red Army in uniform as the backup singers. Um, that was like stunning to everybody in the room that Sweet Home Alabama would be sung right, in Leningrad to a Russian audience um, with Russian version of punk rockers. I can only describe them as that. To understand the um, power of Southern music as an export. And it was great fun, but it was also a teaching moment, so you could see um, uh, what is happening to Southern culture. In the South, words have a life of their own, um, and they're colorful, they're abundant, they can be exaggerations and, 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 and metaphors abound. Right? It, it is a wonderful experience. And it also means that there are a lot of Southernisms you know, that are very particular to the South and may not translate well if you're not from around here. And uh, that's one of the Southernisms. <laughs> Some of the sayings, like down the road a piece. How far is a piece? Nobody needs to know. And if you really, really want to ask that question, you might get the old Southern response, yonder. <laughs> Or they could give you directions. Um, some people say if you need directions, um, it's probably best not to ask <laughs> because you'll get from a real southerner, because you'll get something like, uh, as you do in many small towns, but the south it seems to be more colorful. Oh, y you go down uh, three blocks past that light, uh, and then you're going to turn. Uh, where that old house uh, that with the shutters used to be, and then you go past the Wrinkle Building, uh, you know where that is, you know, before it burned down, and then you're going to go down a couple of miles, uh, and you, uh, you'll see it on the right-hand side, and the phrase I always like, you can't miss it. There are two kinds of big picture people coming into the South. Uh, one, interestingly enough, are Southerners, real Southerners, who have left, whether for um, work or for study, and have returned uh, to um, their hometown and families, uh, only to find it's considerably different, uh, and they too have changed. And they bring something very special, uh, a perspective uh, uh, on both sides. and. and and they are great bridges between the old and the new. The newer um, additions, uh, including myself, um, we, we've come from uh, elsewhere in the States and many from overseas, um, usually for uh, our jobs, uh, and uh, add uh, um, a, a different uh, set of skills to, to the South. Um, if, if people look at the South, again, I, I urge that, uh, historically, uh, after uh, the Civil War, um, uh, there, there was a, a, 
a, a lack of investment, actually, in the South. Uh, there was more uh, of removal of resources, timber and ore and mining, coal, as, as opposed to investment. So you didn't have major corporations uh, building headquarters and, and creating a managerial class here. And that's changing. And that's what the new people are, are bringing. And, and they're doing uh, an amazing job. Uh, it, but it's, um, uh, it, it's like taking an isolated culture, and here's the cultural anthropologist speaking again, uh, and introducing it to vast changes virtually overnight. You know, it, it is a bit messy. It's very creative and innovative. Um, and it's a, a, an experience I wouldn't miss for the world.